Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome. Thank you for joining together this morning as we hear the Word of God in order to strengthen our spirits and keep holy the Lord's Day as best we can. Uh, there may be those who are new to the parish or those uh, like Paul joining from outside the parish. Know that you are welcome and embraced by our community as you honor us by your presence. What do you suppose will happen when the pandemic is over and people are allowed to gather freely and without restrictions at the Eucharistic banquet? Will most Catholics who have been away from mass for many months, perhaps even a year or more, lose taste for the communal gathering and the meal of Jesus? Or will the memory and joy of feasting in the company of our Lord and the community of his disciples be rekindled and made even stronger? I'm unsure of the answer. However, today's scriptures assure us that there is an invitation extended to us each day to feast on God's love, no matter where we are, no matter what our circumstances. Will you and I accept that invitation right here, right now? Thanks to the Crosby family for leading us in our vocal prayers and responses, and you and your uh, domestic church at home join in the prayers and the songs as well. We'll begin with a meditative a reflection on music uh, entitled, In Christ Alone, reflecting Paul's message to us today. Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are stilled, when striving cease. My comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ I stand. In Christ alone, who took on flesh, fullness of God in helpless bay. This gift of love this gift of and love. righteousness Scorned by the ones He came to save Till on that cross as Jesus died The wrath of God was satisfied For every sin on Him was laid here in the death of Christ I live. There in the ground His body lay. Light of the world by darkness lay. Then bursting forth in glorious day Up from the grave he rose again And as he stands in victory Since curse has lost its grip on me For I am his and he is mine Bought with the precious blood of Christ in life, no fear in death, this is the power of Christ in me, from 
life's first cry, first cry to the final breath. Jesus commands my destiny. No power of hell, no scheme of man can never lock me from his hand. Till he returns or calls me home, here in the power of Christ I stand. In Christ alone, in Christ alone. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And your spirit. St. Paul, in his short passage today, gives us a saying we need to commit to memory. And more importantly, repeated at the beginning of each day as we face all the challenges and complications that have befallen us during this time. Paul says, I can do all things in him who strengthens me. I can do all things in him who strengthens me. May that inner conviction that God's strength is among us and within us never leave us. Let us seek God's mercy for the times we have rejected the divine offer to feast on God's love. Lord Jesus, you comfort those who mourn and wipe away our tears. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Christ Jesus, you call us to fullness of life in Christ. Christ, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord Jesus, you strengthen and sustain us in all the circumstances of our lives. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. May Almighty God have mercy on us, forgive us our sins, and bring us to life everlasting. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. God of goodness and kindness, you invite all peoples to the banquet and offer them a feast beyond compare. Give us your saving grace to keep us unstained wearing the robe of our baptism until that day when you welcome us to heaven's joyful table. We ask this through our Lord Jesus Christ, your son who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God forever and ever. Amen. In the Bible, Mountaintops usually represent an encounter with God, like Moses' encounter when he received the Ten Commandments, or Jesus' encounter when he was transfigured atop a mountain in the presence of his disciples. Today's reading gives us a hint of what our mountaintop encounter with God will be like. I invite Jared Riley to deliver our first scripture. A reading from the book of the prophet Isaiah. On this mountain, the Lord of hosts will provide for all peoples, a feast of rich food and choice wines, juicy, rich food and pure choice wines. On this mountain, he will destroy the veil that veils all peoples, the web that is woven over two nations. He will destroy death forever. The Lord God will wipe away the tears from every face. The reproach of his people he will remove from the whole earth, for the Lord has spoken. On that day it will be said, Behold, our God, to whom we look to save us. This is the Lord for whom we looked. Let us rejoice and be glad that he has saved us. For the hand of the Lord will rest on this mountain. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I 
shall live in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. I shall live in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. In verdant pastures he gives me repose. Beside restful waters he leads me. He refreshes my soul. I shall live in the house of the Lord the days of my life. He guides me in the right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk in the dark valley, I fear no evil. For you are at my side with your rod and your staff. That gives me courage. I shall walk in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. You spread the table before me in the sight of my foes. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. I shall live in the house of the Lord all the day of my life. Only goodness and kindness follow me all the days of my life. And I shall dwell in the house of the Lord for years to come. I shall live in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. I think St. Paul would have fared well were he alive today and living through all the challenges we're facing. He trusted completely that God would care for him in any and all circumstances. We would do well to learn from his example. I invite Gina and I to deliver our second scripture. A reading from the letter of St. Paul to the Philippians. <clears throat> Brothers and sisters, I know how to live in humble circumstances. I know also how to live with abundance. In every circumstance and in all things, I have learned the secret of being well fed and of going hungry, of living in abundance and of being in need. I can do all things in him who strengthens me. Still, it was kind of you to share in my distress. My God will fully supply whatever you need in accord with his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. To our God and Father, glory forever and ever. Amen. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Alleluia. 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 May the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ enlighten the eyes of the hearts that we may know the hope that belongs to our call. Alleluia. 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 
Brothers and sisters, the Lord is with you. Your spirit. A reading from the good news according to Matthew. Glory to you, Lord. Jesus again in reply spoke to the chief priests and elders of the people in parables saying, the kingdom of heaven may be likened to a king who gave a wedding feast for his son. He sent his servants to summon invited guests to the feast, but they refused to come. A second time he sent other servants saying, tell those invited, behold, I have prepared my banquet. My calves and fattened cattle are killed and everything is ready, come to the feast. Some ignored the invitation and went away, one to his farm, another to his business. The rest laid hold of his servants, mistreated them and killed them. The king was enraged and sent his troops, destroyed those murderers and burned their city. Then he said to his servants, the feast is ready, but those who were invited weren't worthy to come. Therefore go out into the main roads and invite to the feast whomever you find. So the servants went out into the streets and gathered all they found, bad and good alike, and the hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to meet the guests, he saw a man there not dressed in a wedding garment. And the king said to him, my friend, how is it that you came in here without a wedding garment? But the man was reduced to silence. Then the king said to his attendants, bind his hand and feet, cast him into the darkness outside, where there will be wailing and grinding of teeth. Many are invited, but few are chosen. For our challenge, the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. The last few weeks of our gospel parables have been rather challenging. There have been some very harsh and even violent images in all of them the last several weeks. I've asked Dr. Mary Beth Lamb from our parish if she would help unfold the scriptures for us and that we might have some clearer insight. How have you come dressed for this feast? Are you still in your pajamas? Did you go running beforehand and you're still in your sweaty clothes? Did you put on a nice top over your shorts and sweats just to look presentable? Regardless, I'm sure you've been in a situation where what you wore and what was deemed appropriate clashed. Like in my first job out of my MA program, teaching religion at Immaculata High School in Leavenworth, Kansas. I thought all the faculty would be dressed wearing costumes for Halloween, and I dressed as a witch. It caused an uproar in my classroom as students laughed and cried that it was no different than usual as I really was a witch. Oh, the principal came in, it was humiliating to say the least. Today's parable has a surprising element that makes us wonder. We might be able to accept that the first invitees didn't come, although we might wonder why they felt it necessary to kill the messengers and that the king responded with rage and violence. I saw some of you shaking your head when John read that. But when the king invites everyone in from off the street and then throws out the one person who isn't dressed properly, don't you wonder? He was just off the street. How could he be dressed? Well, it made me wonder. So I backed up to see the context. And this context is twofold as I see it. Number one, the circumstances of the community that Matthew is addressing in his gospel, and two, the placement of this parable within the gospel of Matthew, how it fits into his storyline. Regarding the first, the book of Matthew was probably written between 75 and 100 CE for a fairly well-to-do urban community of Greek-speaking Jewish Christians. 
the majority are Jewish, still faithful to the Jewish law, who see Jesus as the fulfillment of their Jewish heritage, but there are Gentile Christians as well. They have lived through the terrors of the Jewish revolt against Rome and the destruction of the temple and Jerusalem in the early 70s. There's evidence of a sharp conflict between Jewish Christians and the rabbinic leadership of post 70s Jerusalem. Matthew's gospel is written at this time of transition in the early church, when people were concerned about the connection to their Jewish roots and anxious about the future of the Gentile mission. Christianity had begun a wrenching separation from the rest of Judaism, which included persecution and martyrdom. This context can help explain the violence that disturbs us in this parable. The second context, this parable in Matthew 22 hangs together with what has come before. For the last three weeks, we have listened to three parables addressed to the same audience, the chief priests and the elders. Reading these three parables in light of what's come before opens up things for me. Now, the previous chapter, Matthew 21, starts with the triumphant entry into Jerusalem, what we celebrate on Palm Sunday. The crowds and the children shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Jesus then goes into the temple, drives out the money changers and the dove sellers, and brings in the blind and the lame to heal them. This latter would have been seen as problematic, as the blind and the lame are physically blemished and thus forbidden from entry into the temple. The chief priests are indignant. This Jesus is not following the rules, letting the blind and lame into the temple, uh, not shutting up the children who keep hollering, Hosanna to the son of David. We see two starkly painted pictures, the acclaim of the people and the reproach of the elders. The next day, Jesus is hungry and he looks to a fig tree for some fruit, but he only finds leaves on the tree. He proclaimed, Never again shall you produce fruit, and it withered up instantly. That fig tree is an object lesson in what Jesus is finding with the Jewish elders. A fig tree is supposed to bear fruit, but this one doesn't, so Jesus curses it for being all show, looking healthy, but really it's just a hypocritical fig tree. In the next episode, Jesus enters the temple to teach again, and the chief priests demand to know, by what authority are you doing this? Who gave you the power? It's like they see his authority. It's obvious that he has it. He heals, he teaches, he commands, and the tree withers, and yet they want to argue with him about it because his authority is not sanctioned by them. He doesn't belong to their ranks. But Jesus turns the question back at them. Well, who gave John the authority to baptize, God or humans? But they can't or they won't answer. They say, we don't know, but really they see a trap. They think they know, but if they say it's by God, then Jesus can ask them, well, why didn't you get baptized then? And if they say human, the people will be upset because they see John the Baptist as a prophet. So because the elders refuse to answer, Jesus refuses the same. The elders have hedged their bets. They are the bet hedgers. And then we get three parables about bet hedgers. The first, the father who asked his son to do some work in the vineyard. The one says yes, but then never goes. And the second says no, but then repents and takes care of things. The second parable, the tenants of the vineyard who beat the owner's messengers and killed his son 
thinking that then they would inherit the entire vineyard. And today, the wedding feast to which the original invitees fail to show. Just before this parable starts, Matthew indicates that the chief priests and Pharisees heard the first two parables and realized that Jesus was talking about them. Uh, these stories were dangerous for Jesus to tell because it made the elders stop hedging their bets and determine to have Jesus arrested. I feel the bind in which Jesus was placed. I know what it's like to have your authority questioned and your ministry rejected. I feel the sadness and anger Jesus might have expressed in this parable. He was stymied in his call to teach, to heal, to create a new order where all would eat together on the holy mountain we saw depicted in Isaiah, where all the destitute and the rich, the common people and the Jewish elites would share in a feast together. But the Jewish elites refused to cooperate, just like the ones who refused to attend the wedding feast. Some passively ignoring the invitation, just going about their business, while others actively laid hold of the servants and killed them. This story had to end in violence. Jesus had found a fisher point, pounded the stake into it, and out flew the rage and the plot to trap Jesus, at first in his speech, and then to arrest and kill him. It hurtled Jesus all the way to Calvary. There is such pain in this story of a king celebrating his son's marriage, but slapped in the face with, we're not coming, and then thinking, Maybe they'll change their minds, like the second son who repented. But no, they killed the messengers. And so the party is opened out to everyone on the streets, the good and the bad, the impure and the pure, like Jesus who ate with sinners, tax collectors, prostitutes. And yet, just when you think you understand the story, there appears the man not dressed properly. Well, what on earth is that about? His saying nothing, is that like the elders who won't say where John got his authority from? Is he hedging his bets? Or as one commentator suggested, is he a stand-in for Jesus, silent before Pilate, bound hand and foot and taken outside of the city to Golgotha? Well, the elders certainly saw Jesus as acting, dressing improperly by letting the blind and the lame into the temple, eating with sinners, and twisting their words against themselves. Or thinking of the situation of Matthew's community, if the elders were the guests who didn't show, and the Christians, the ones who did, might it be that some of the Christians were smug thinking that since they accepted Jesus, they had nothing more to do. They belonged to the kingdom because they shared in the banquet. They had said yes, they came to the feast, but did they do the work, the deeds of the kingdom? Matthew might've been trying to tell his community, just because you share in the feast, you've been baptized, doesn't mean you've made it. You could still get thrown out. And there we are, we too can get smug. I'm Catholic, or I go to the Zoom church every Sunday, or I'm pro-life, or I'm anti-racist, whatever. What do you think? Is the stake driven into your own heart like it has mine? This is the main point. Will we let Jesus see into our hearts break them wide open, past debates of authority or not, past defenses of who was right and who was wrong, past the traps and barbed words, past the hedging of bets, and broken will we come to the feast, dressed and ready 
to do the work of the kingdom. The invitation stands. Thank you, Mary Beth, for looking at those challenging parables and giving us a key to unlock them. Let us profess our faith in the God who invites us all to his banquet in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From there, he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. Let us offer our prayer with confidence that God will care for our every need, knowing what is best for us. I invite Judy and Dave Tedesco uh, to lead our petitions. For Pope Francis, for his health and well being, that he may continue his efforts to call us to a more authentic following of Christ and a greater devotion to being messengers of God's mercy to the world. Let us pray to the world, Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. That all Christians, clothed like in the sun's shining garment of baptism, may one day be united also at the Eucharistic table of the Lord. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. That the Lord God will console all the people who suffer from the recent fires in California and wipe away the tears of all who struggle with family difficulties, economic burdens, with addictions, and with illness of any kind. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For a more just distribution of the goods of the earth, that everyone may have a share of life's banquet. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer that all of us gathered here in prayer may find the presence of the Lord each day within our families and friends and around the tables where we share our daily meals. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. That the Lord, who will one day destroy death, bring all our faithful departed to the feast of life, especially those who have died from the pandemic and in natural disasters. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. In silence, let us bring our personal needs and intentions to God. May the invitation to your feast, O God, remind us that all is grace. Let us turn away no one who comes to your table seeking your mercy and love. Fulfill the prayers we make and let the Eucharist be a living sign of the banquet of eternal life. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us gather all our prayers into one in the words that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Deliver us, Lord, from every evil, and graciously grant peace in our day, that by the help of your mercy we may be free from sin and safe from all distress as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. 
for the kingdom and the power and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. Lord Jesus Christ, you said to your apostles, I leave you peace, my peace I give you. Look not upon our sins, on our refusal to your invitation, but look on the faith of your church and graciously grant her peace and unity in accordance with your will, who we'll live and reign forever and ever. Amen. May the peace of the Lord be always with you. And with and your spirit. spirit. Those of you at prayer with your family are invited to share the Lord's peace. Those of us at home alone extend that peace from our hearts to one another. Unable to gather in physical presence with one another around the Lord's table, nonetheless, we know that Jesus desires to dwell within us. And so we pray our prayer of spiritual communion. Lord Jesus, you are with us always, especially when we gather in your name, to hear your word in scripture, and be fed by your sacred body and blood. When we cannot physically come to the Eucharistic table, be with us still. May your right presence fill our hearts and send us with love to care for the earth and all our brothers and sisters. Amen. Almighty God, may the saving word we have heard and heeded fill us with life and gladness and transform us into witnesses to the gospel of Jesus Christ, for he lives and reigns forever and ever. Amen. Thanks to all of you for joining in prayer this morning, and thanks to our participants, our readers, and our homilist. I'll be sharing communion outside the doors of the church at 1230 uh, today for those who might wish to receive. You can stay in touch with us through our parish website, our Facebook page, and our newsletter, The Timely Perpetuan. This Wednesday from 7 to 8 p.m. at our weekly town hall gathering, Father Ron Schmidt will be with us. Father Ron is pastor of St. Anne's Church in Byron. As we look to the coming national election, Father Ron will share with us the principles of Catholic social teaching based on the gospel and offered as guides as we make critical decisions for the future of our nation and the good of all our citizens. So I invite you to join us Wednesday at seven. October is Respect Life Month and the month of Mary's Rosary. Good opportunity to use that meditative prayer as an opportunity uh, to ask God's protection and safety for our world. And uh, the rosary is prayed online on Friday mornings at 10 o'clock, open uh, to everyone. We don't want to miss the opportunity uh, to be together for Oktoberfest. It's not going to be like it was all those glorious years and years of um, being either on our parking lot or on the field together with the colorful tents and all the kids games and so on but we still would like to uh, share some time together this Saturday, October 17th. Uh, we've got over 300 food orders for the meals. Uh, Chef Mike and Sarah is really gonna have his hands full with his cooking crew. Uh, and those uh, dinners that you ordered, uh, and I believe it's the cutoff time has already passed, but um, they'll be available on Saturday afternoon. And uh, if you placed an order, you'll get information during the week on when your time slot uh, will be. So anytime after uh, 3.30 uh, to uh, I think 5.30. Um, and you can drive by the community center and pick your food up. And then don't eat it until six o'clock because at six o'clock, uh, we're going to be gathered together on a Zoom Oktoberfest, and uh, we're gonna uh, play three bingo games. If you've ordered the bingo cards, they'll be with your, with your food order. And uh, we're hoping we have some participation from our uh, kids in the parish of all ages. Uh, you can send in a, a 60 second video clip of a talent, 
so that we can uh, have a talent co show contest. Uh, the younger kids uh, coloring uh, contest, the older kids a photo contest, and all of that information is on the parish website. Uh, you send the video clips on as it shows at the bottom of the screen uh, to Christoph at stperpetua.org and all the other coloring and photo submissions by October 16th. So we hope to see all of you on Zoom at six o'clock next Saturday and look for that information about uh, your pickup time for your uh, Oktoberfest dinner. As you may have seen in the news, uh, Contra Costa County Health Department has uh, relaxed some of the restrictions because the county's numbers uh, are dropping. We moved from purple to the red, um, which is good, and we need to keep going down. So they've uh, allowed for the opening of churches for communal uh, public services um, at a 25% rate of how many people the space can actually fit uh, or 100 people, whatever is less. In our church, with the six foot distancing, we could fit about 40 people uh, for service. Um, and possibly using the grand hall, we can extend that and have more. It's gonna take some work to do that. I wanna continue our Sunday experience at 9.30 and 11.30. Um, I think that is meeting the needs of a large number of us. But I also want to add a Saturday evening mass um, where people can gather at the church. Uh, again, it would be it's limited numbers and uh, there's all kinds of work that has to be done. I can't do it unless I get at least two dozen uh, parish volunteers under the age of 60 who will be willing to be on a team to help as guides, as ushers and things like that and uh, set up, clean up and, and so on. If you uh, can help out and are willing to do that, please contact Christoph or myself or leave your name uh, with Wendy at the, at the parish office. So we're gonna close with a song that you all know and I invite you to uh, join in at home and the words certainly are most appropriate for us today.
May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you kindly and give you his peace. And may Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Have a good afternoon, everyone, and a wonderful and safe week. Listen.